what I planned to do um, in, in my talk was first to speak a little bit about uh, the scorecard in general, what we wanted to do this, and, and thereby give a sort of snapshot of European foreign policy and how it was in 2012, um, and then zoom in afterwards on China. Uh, that's the chapter that I've contributed as, as author, and I've been doing the last three years while I'm also writing other reports on, um, uh, on China and European relations. So, I mean, if you look at the scorecard, we started it three years ago and was a little bit of sort of an effort to um, try and, and, and make a measurement of how is Europe doing on, on foreign policy. It was sort of after the Lisbon Treaty where there was the initial um, uh, sort of sense of now Europe is moving in to become a global actor. There will be the European External Action Service. Uh, the European sort of version of a, of a joint, uh, joined up foreign ministry um, led by, uh, by Baroness Axton as the, as the first new um, secretary of, of the institution. Um, and so we wanted basically to say, okay, when, when um, so this is the new sort of beginning and let's see how, how the track record fares. As you all know, Euro crisis came at the same time. So a lot of our findings the last couple of years have been very heavily influenced by that. That in reality, the sort of bandwidth for foreign policy and for making Europe into a global actor has been, uh, to a large degree, pushed um, aside by the euro crisis. Um, I think in the first year we wrote that Europe was sort of distracted by the euro crisis. I think the second year we wrote that Europe was just slightly, it was actually diminished as a foreign policy actor on the euro crisis. Um, this year, the conclusion is actually a little bit more positive, but on, on the sort of slightly, I would say, negative background that I just provided in the sense that um, uh, we have called it in the introduction a surprisingly uh, good year, uh, in the sense that you can see sort of resilience in a lot of the, of the different areas, that Europe is actually um, not at least going up completely up the seams, but, uh, and we've actually given somewhat better grades in, uh, in, in some of the areas. That, since I'm now sitting with all the knowledge that we've presented in, in, in different capitals uh, earlier on, I mean, I know in, in Brussels that even sparked a bit of discussion where even the, some of the people, top people from the AS contested that, where there was really such a, a good year, which is also why I now give the background of saying we've done it for three years, the grades started very, very low because we basically said, well, the ambition of creating Europe into a global actor has been overshadowed by, uh, by the euro crisis. Um, and that's what takes up the sort of, uh, sucks up the, the mental energy of, of European leaders. Um, so that's a little bit of the, of the background to why we're still th this year sort of talking about a surprisingly, uh, surprisingly good year. Um, how do we do it? I mean, we try to evaluate what, uh, how Europe uh, achieves its goals in, in the world. We're a team of, um, of researchers um, uh, where we have in each member state, there is a national researcher that helps us where we'd send them questions and, can you all see? Yeah. Um, you'd send them question. Um, I actually don't even know my Irish, Ben Tumra, he's not here today. Ben Tumra is a former yeah. researcher. This yeah, is exactly. Yeah. Well, um, um, so so in, each, uh, in each country we would have somebody, in this case in, for Ireland, it's, it's uh, Ben who's helping us out. Um, and then we divide it into these components, you can see on sort of di six big categories and, and, um, and on the member states. I think sort of one of the novelties that ECFR introduced is basically also in not just in the scorecard but in general also grading uh, the member states. Um, in some of the publications I've been doing where we've, in, in the China program, we're doing a power audit of EU-China relations instead of just looking at what comes out of Brussels, out of the sort of policy statements out of EU-China summits and so on, also saying, but what are the different groupings of member state countries? How do they align themselves? Um, and in that one, the EU-China power audit had sort of different, sort of slightly quirky names for the different groups of countries that are accommodating the cancer list and the, uh, the gung-ho free traders and sort of put in, in different groupings to show how is actually uh, China policy uh, that comes out of Brussels made out of these different groupings. So in the same methodology we've used with the scorecard of saying, well, we don't just evaluate Brussels, but also of like how the different member states either contribute um, or dilute uh, sort of the effort to, to shape a common, uh, a common policy.
So that's where we categorize member states as leaders, supporters, and slackers, which through the years, I mean, I would say now we have to sort of do a double research almost because the countries have now found out. So of course, when Ben and others in other countries now go around asking some of the questions, particularly if it's to the MFAs, my own former profession, people would of course try to spin it and say, no, no, we've been doing this and this this year to help Europe and so on. Well, knowing that, of course, it all in the end it ends up in some sort of grading, uh, grading system. Um, and my own take, just to sort of say, it's, I don't think you, it's not a sort of scientific. I think it's a well researched, but basically we also want to come out in the end with a sort of narrative about how was that year and so on. So it's I don't see it in, in that sense, even though we have to grade as a, as a system as a sort of completely scientific system of sort of evaluating because we've sometimes had foreign policy discussion where people have gone a lot into the methodology but you could and all that is interesting and if you have any comments on it we're always keen to improve it uh, but I think I tend to emphasize to say it's a way of providing a snapshot of where, where Europe is heading more than it is a completely sort of uh, scientific study of this is um, as I said about 212 I mean one of the, the things we said uh, in the introduction was that Compared to the two previous year, where there's that feeling of complete unraveling, um, there is a sense in, in several of the, the areas, um, in my own area, <coughs> with China slightly as well, where we gave uh, uh, slightly uh, better grades, but again from a relatively low starting point. Um, with Russia as well, I think some of my colleagues there, some of the way uh, um, EU dealt with Russia and its entry into the WTO um, and so forth. Um, but of course, there's still this big question looming over over Europe about which we put on the, the sort of the question of, of Europe's continued loss of um, of soft power. Basically, the, the fact that the euro crisis sort of dents Europe's image uh, abroad, and that of course has an impact on how well are we able to sort of achieve our goals in in the world. Um, and that one we have actually thought could be really interesting to do a separate study on of trying to sort of look Europe from the outside and sort of take a group of, of uh, large and particularly emerging powers, China, India, and so on, and see how does that spill over into perception of, of Europe as a, as a foreign policy actor. Because right now it's, it's more of a statement, a feeling that you, you get, particularly from my own um, research with meeting with, with Chinese interlocutors, it's really like, well, is Europe still doing anything in foreign policy? I thought it was all about the Euro crisis, so of course, that's the primary question, even when you come as a foreign policy researcher, we will be asked about Euro crisis, what's going to happen, uh, what's going to happen next. So, I mean, the positive note is that, yeah, as you can see below, is that European uh, foreign policy didn't unravel in, in 212. Um, here you can see the different components we have. It's the relations with China, as I mentioned, it's the relations with Russia, it's with the US. Um, it's wider Europe, which, uh, yeah, that includes um, uh, uh, Turkey uh, as well and sort of the Balkan. Um, then of course the middle the Middle East and North Africa where it's been particularly important to sort of measure how uh, Europe has been able to sort of um, shape up to the uh, events of the Arab Spring. And then the last one is sort of of course one which in many ways is sort of core of, of European raison d'etre sort of multilateral issues uh, um, CSDP missions EU in, in the UN um, but again out of all of these there's a wealth of detail so sometimes it's also you can say you can you can have talks going on on each of uh, each of those issues and um, uh, and, and and stay on them for a long time so I mean I'm happy to when we do Q&A to, to uh, sort of answer a question as best as I can and so also some of my colleagues uh, area but of course I'll zoom in more on um, on uh, China. Um, then just a couple of words on, on the EAS uh, as well, which was, was meant a little bit to be the sort of the vehicle for, for Europe's new foreign policy uh, ambitions. I think one of the things, again, uh, we've seen over all three years, and also links with what I'm going to say about China, is we've seen a sort of um, a slight renationalization of uh, foreign policy that in reality at the same time as Europe institutionally with Lisbon Treaty, with, with setting up new tools in Brussels, we're actually moving towards the, um, setting up something that should create a more coherent framework. Uh, several member states, particularly among um, the bigger ones, sort of moved to uh, uh, moving 
slightly back and having more of it sort of uh, national. I mean, UK is, of course, an example of out of, out of also a policy stance by, by, by the current government of sort of always viewing things first <laughs> through sort of the national interest. But you've seen something similar with, with Germany, both, of course, with the pivotal role it plays in, um, in the Euro crisis, but also the way that it's becoming more and more sort of shaping force in, in the sort of um, relations with emerging power, and with China in particular, which I'll uh, come back to. One of the <coughs> studies I, I wrote last year was called, on, on China and Germany, was called the Emerging Special Relationship, and, and sort of looked at how um, China and, and Germany, where Germany now takes up 50 or 47 percent of European, uh, so close to half of all European exports to China, meaning that they are sort of the same size as the three, four big ones, UK, uh, France, um, Italy, Spain, combined. Uh, so there's really a difference in, in, in size there, beyond that the German economy, of course, is, 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 is larger than, than, than the others. Um, and that, of course, has also started to have a, a sort of political superstructure that Germany now does these sort of uh, government to government consultations where Merkel basically sits <coughs> down and before with Wen Jiabao, now it's going to be with Li Keqiang on the Chinese side and with all their ministers on both sides discussing very practically everything from innovation policy to an industrial policy to education, uh, vocational training, and uh, which is actually the largest sort of gathering that China has with any outside power, bigger than what it does with the US, where it's much more focused, of course, on, on strategic and um, uh, affairs. Uh, but here with, with the Germans, much more sort of broad specters on, on but starting from, from the economy. And that, of course, to, to a certain degree, does suck out some of the, I'm not necessarily saying when Germany is doing that, this is like sort of to the detriment of Europe, uh, but it does at least suck out some of the energy when you have uh, the largest member state that uh, uses a lot of its bilateral energy in, in building its own sort of strategic uh, relationship um, with, with China. I have a couple here, but I think I want to on some of the sort of most successful and the least successful, well, I mean, one I can highlight from my own here when we, st when if I stop on the least successful is China and the Dalai Lama uh, issues of, I think one that shows quite well the sort of the change in, 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 in power structure. If we go back 20 years, uh, Europeans um, after Tiananmen in 89 were able to put sanctions on, um, on China where the remains are still the, the arms embargo and and now we have a sort of reverse situation where when European leaders decide to receive the Dalai Lama, even if it's a private capacity, China would, of course, um, officially announce its anger, but would also slap this type of what you can almost call soft sanctions of like that ministers are not allowed and trying to sort of curb elements of trade and, uh, and investment. Um, the UK, as, as, as the country in Europe right now, is suffering under that. And it's definitely one of the areas where you can see that the EU and member states combined have been the least effective to try to find some sort of uh, musketeer oath for how to protect one another against these sort of uh, uh, Chinese um, uh, re reprisals that then hit a member state individually. And then the others are just happy, like Hollande, who was just on his first visit and just happy it's not him that's in the, in the dark house or the deep freezer like Cameron is, uh, is at the moment. Um, but I think it's, it's an important policy to highlight that... Uh, that that's at least where Europe hasn't been able then to sort of pull sort of combined strength but fall individually. Um, say a little. I'll s mention this one then and then uh, come on to, um, uh, to uh, China more generally. This is more that just shows the sort of the leaders and slackers. There is a natural advantage of being big. So, I mean, it, that also reflects in our, so uh, the, the, the big three, of course, come out on, on quite a number of issues as, as leaders. Um, and but I think when that being said, and that's uh, then you actually have a number of, of smaller countries that, uh, in a sort of uh, slogan, sort of punch about their weight. Sweden is the one I, I can uh, mention uh, particularly. I mean, where you see here has sort of a leader on, on ten component, and um, so you, you see on, on different areas that there are also groupings of smaller member states to take initiative. I mean, as Dathy highlighted before, Ireland 
is 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 um, singled out as a leader in four of the issues here in the in the scorecard. Um, so uh, so I think we tried also with this to sort of show um, the full complexity of basically European foreign policy making that is 27 member states that make it up and there are in some areas there's some that take initiative in others uh, others so um, um, and you could say one of the perhaps surprising finding on the UK is that, uh, that um, uh, with all the talk there is about about the UK about the UK potential referendum and, and even uh, an exit uh, following that uh, in foreign policy uh, UK still counts and is actually an, an important player, at least on, on the way that uh, uh, we have measured in, in 212. Then let me um, jump into um, into China, which is my own uh, uh, my own favorite pet uh, topic. Just a, a quick commercial while this is here. This one here is was our big project of um, our last year called Three, China 3.0, which. Um, Mark Leonard and a couple of others and I did together at the, the European Council on Foreign Relations. It's um, uh, an idea to sort of show, give an insight into Chinese debates that uh, very often from the outside and here in Europe, China is seen as a sort of monolith of thought. You have sort of the official party documents that are, um, and, but in reality, there's a huge debate going on inside China about where the country is heading. And we wanted to give sort of a, a, a better or Put the limelight on these debates, and so here with 15 sort of of China's top public uh, intellectuals, we try to sort of look at where is China heading in the next decade, both on economy, on the foreign policy, and on um, social and political reform. And rather than focus on sort of leadership personalities in a in a time of of change in China, then look at what are the trends that's going to shape. Um, uh, China and in reality, I find that sometimes the debate can be even more lively than in in, in our own uh, liberal democracies, where we know democracy is a is a good thing that we take as a, a given. We take into the international liberal order as another uh, given, which is something that's debated in China. Whether is this a good thing for China? Would democracy be a good thing? Um, and so, um, so that one has really been one of our key works on. Um, uh, on China, and uh, but back to uh, to the scorecard and how we um, we looked at, at China in 2012. Uh, the first one I, I put up and sort of as my head as what well, China didn't become the sort of the red knight of the euro crisis. What do I mean by that? Um, there I have to go back a little bit because when we did scorecard and er earlier, just to remind you, in like the sort of end to 11, you had. Uh, leading up to the European Council when the ESFS was um, the sort of the, the temporary rescue um, fund was set up, there was the idea to sort of leverage that, that if Europe just put in, um, I think it was 400 billion, then we would be able to leverage up to one trillion and that would be with the help of emerging powers where they would especially look to China, also to Japan actually, because of their currency reserves. Anyway, that sort of never really materialized, then there is a lot of talk about how present is China in, in, in uh, different national countries, European, in their depth in buying up sort of public uh, bonds. And I think it's fair to say that, I mean, what we've, what we've seen is that China sort of rhetorically and positively has been very committed to the euro. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, China, EU 27 is China's largest export market. So it matters a lot, of course, what, what happens in uh, but we hadn't seen China as to sort of in any way with any game-changing amount of its currency reserves sort of suddenly flushed into um, to Europe. We saw um, a contribution through the IMF uh, on uh, 43 um, billion uh, US dollars, which is, I mean, to be uh, reckoned with and positive, but I mean, not the sort of game-changing amount, which makes that sort of going back to some of the dreams of some in 2011, that China would really be the one with their currency reserve that would just sort of prop up uh, Europe and the, the nightmare of others saying, well, this is going to create a completely new level of financial dependency. Uh, conclusion here uh, in 2013 is that that didn't really happen. Um, so that's sort of the, um, the first, which also makes that you, on, on the second, which is more institutional, you had two EU-China um, summits in, in, in uh, 2012, but it didn't necessarily produce us 
more results for, for that reason. I mean, actually, the one that was postponed in 2011 was due, and then it was moved into 2012, was due to the euro crisis, but well, was actually because there had to be an emergency meeting on, on the euro, and uh, we then postponed. Being one that studies China, I always remember seeing that from the Chinese side somewhat odd. It was the same period where we were sort of quoting the Chinese for whether they wouldn't sort of come in with the money, and then we sort of cancelled the meeting on a very short term because we said we would have to do an emergency meeting on our own, which made sense in European logic, but just didn't really very link very much if you at the same time wanted to. Um, anyway, those two meetings were then held. Uh, normally, there's E1 EU China summit a year, was then, were then held in, in 212. Um, which showed sort of the, the period of sort of slightly panicky approach uh, was over, but uh, on the other hand, it wasn't either sort of meetings that produced sort of great um, results. Then my third point is basically where I'm saying that all member states tend to be very strategic about China, but uh, slightly on their, on their own, um, that it's, it's more and more prevalent at the same time as, as there isn't that much new cooperation coming into sort of EU-China summit, you have more and more member states signing their own bilateral strategic partnerships uh, with China. Um, I think Ireland also uh, recently during a visit had uh, its own bi bilateral. I, I as a, so, I mean, uh, as a serving civil servant, a full disclaimer, was the one negotiating uh, one for Denmark back in 2008, and we were, were of course very proud of sort of a small country that managed to get a strategic partnership with, uh, with China. But now looking at it as a researcher, it does make that all member states focus on much of their energy basically on, on trying to sort of court uh, China bilaterally. That makes sense because China represents commercial opportunities, and, but it does also make European sort of joint priorities like a secondary, uh, secondary concern. Uh, and that's where I come back to, to Germany as, as not as the worst at all, but just as the one that's the biggest at the same time. So when Germany also starts slightly to move in a bilateral um, direction, and when you speak with German civil servants, they say, well, we would love Ashton and the Brussels scenery to take the lead on this with China, but nothing is happening, and, and our, our sort of uh, commercial links are just so great. So now sort of some of the things are following on. Um, like the sort of government to government consultation uh, I mentioned, which is really sort of the biggest um, cabinet sit down that the Chinese have with them. Um, um, and, and the sort of one other development from last year, which wasn't even sort of one member state relation, was actually a sort of regional development that, that China set up this um, Central and Eastern European Secretariat based on um, a summit in, in Poland where um, all of the e Eastern European and Central European, and actually also member states of the EU, but also some of the, um, the states of uh, the Balkan states that are not yet members uh, of the EU were present. That was actually on sort of the Chinese insistence that it was like a, a, a larger grouping. That of course also raised discussions about um, uh, whether is China a little bit setting up uh, like the Shanghai Corporation, the SCO, its own sort of internal regional organizations inside Europe, and you could almost compare it to like that we had 10 years ago, uh, Rumsfeld was dividing Europe into all the new Europe based on strategic uh, preferences, and now you have China based more on business map, where, where do we see openings, sort of here's how we want to make our, our Europe map of, of, of new and old Europe. Um, I must say, though, that uh, I think the, uh, the Central and Eastern European countries got a little bit of um, either you call it cold feet or a little bit more lukewarm on also when they saw the way it was seen afterwards in, in, um, in, in Brussels, particularly by the Poles that were uh, the lead on, on that. And when the Secretariat later was set up, it was very much a sort of Chinese Secretariat. Originally, it was meant to be one with, or the Chinese had hoped it to be staffed with both um, uh, Europeans and um, um, and Chinese as well. And a lot of that is, is very linked to sort of commercial opportunities. There's an investment fund in it. There is um, sort of different openings for, for sort of joint science parks. And um, so all things you could say that most European member states anyway are, are, would really like to, to set up with, with China. Um, so uh, in a sense, to give a fair assessment of that evolution, uh, I think it also shows, and particularly some of my talks with, with Polish officials, that they have been feel left out of sort of uh, drafting EU's uh, policies. Say, well, 
either come it uh, either it comes from Berlin or it comes from uh, Paris or London, and we're not really part of it, and we don't see ourselves anymore as sort of new member state in that sense. And particularly Poland, of course, uh, sees it as a sort of right for place among the big six. So I think they also wanted, and if there's a lesson also from for for Brussels, it's probably that bring them more into sort of how to to shape the the, the common policy because. And so, on the smaller um, Eastern European countries that I that I that were talked with, officials said, "Well, for us, it was just a practical way of getting to meet one of the Chinese leaders, even though we had to queue up all 16 and it was like 30, 20 minutes each. It was better than waiting for a, for a Chinese visit, which might come or might not come. So, um, I think that's that's important to give a sort of full uh, picture of the whole thing. Then the last thing I wanted to um, to highlight from um, uh, the scorecard, and which I think could be also uh, a good way to, um, to start the uh, debate, is uh, one of the categories I, I had in the scorecard is also broader about uh, EU's relation with, with with Asia, where to character uh, characterize it, it, it's been slightly based on two C's that it's mostly China that we see Asia as China as the emerging power, and we see it as the other C as commerce. Um, and very little in sort of strategic realm, um, and and particularly at the moment where you have sort of daily news trickling in on the Chinese and the Japanese on these island disputes, which for uh, many Europeans of course are hard to get. Are they really willing to sort of almost fight over some sort of rocks that only prop up half of the year out of out by sea? But these are really sort of big uh, conflictual issues in, in in Asia. The same with the whole sort of the U.S. Uh, so-called pivot and now sort of rebranded as the rebalancing to Asia um, and what that means for uh, for Europe. Um, and we put uh, in the scorecard this year that that Europe hasn't really had that sort of strategic discussion among itself again because a lot of the energy goes um, goes elsewhere well, just sort of in, in, in survival mode about what does this actually really mean for Europe and what are our sort of strategic interests. Do we also as a transatlantic ally, want to sort of move with the U.S. to Asia? Do we do we have the capacity for that? Do we um, want to shape a more independent role for ourselves in some of these issues where we can see that since we don't have a military presence in Asia as an honest broker? Do we just want to say, well, it's too complicated? Do we want to stay in our? Um, we didn't want to be that much of a global actor. We want to stay in our new abroad, which could be a sort of type of division of labor type of approach of saying, well. In the future, if, if the U.S. is moving to Asia and it's leading more from behind, Europe has to be able to deal much more with future situations in, in Libya, future Georgia, in the sort of near abroad, and, and, and Asia is, um, is, is too far away. At least, uh, what we wanted to bring in, uh, to the attention is that, that that debate and that whole of seeing Asia also as conflict, conflict potential, of course, uh, with the big elephant in the room, the rise of China and, uh, and and how that sort of makes new um, coalition and alliance patterns in, in Asia, where again Europeans have mostly been focused only on China as a story about sort of emerging economic opportunities, which is of course the last piece still is and still will, it will, will be, particularly if the Chinese manage the transition now moving from to the investment and export that grows to more growth created by domestic consumption, and that of course uh, will entail completely new opportunities to continue not just producing in China but also selling and exporting uh, to the Chinese market. So but so that was basically the last point of saying here is a big sort of strategic discussion which somehow sort of passed almost under the radar in, 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 in the European uh, debate. Uh, I know when I talked with the industry before that we've been writing on the South China Sea issues and trying to give them, uh, provide a background for them into the European for European audiences, and I think I think that's really important because uh, whereas we've been used to seeing Europe as sort of the navel of of, of and the centre of, of Europe, I mean that's moving more towards the east, and, and and where others early on had to react to how the concept of Europe was shaping things, we might have to react to how the concept of Asia is uh, is shaping things in the future, um, and so so sort of not just the economic relations, but also the strategic relations playing out in Asia are going to be hugely important for us.